Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Uplifting Impact Podcast. My name is Deanna Singh, and I am the Chief Change Agent for Uplifting Impact. We are always so excited to be hosting all of you today as we dive deeper into our collective journey of what makes the world more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive. Today, we are so lucky to be joined by Robin Johnson. Robin is the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Cottage Health. She is passionate about supporting the people who make up organizations and institutions in delivering on the commitment to diversity and inclusion. Her expertise is in cultural transformation through the development and execution of organization-wide equity and strategic planning and creating engagement opportunities for leaders and teams to really leverage their capacity and their ability to lead organizational change management. Now, I know those of you who are doing this work understand how important it is to have that expertise as something that you can rely on because everything that we're doing is all about change management. One of her personal beliefs is that she thinks that the sweet spot of DEI work is where you can, and I love this because all we do, Robin, here is talk about bridges, but really the sweet spot of DEI work is when you can create a bridge between the heart and the head. Robin, welcome to our show. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to be here. Absolutely. Well, we are just so glad that you were able to join us. Now, one of the things we like to do with our our guests is give people an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. Um, So I do have a question for you. This is a reflective question. I, when I was thinking about this question, I kind of was trying to answer it for myself too. So I'm curious how you're going to answer. But my question is, what is one of the most surprising things that you have learned about yourself in the past year? Oh, wow. What a great question. I will say in my professional life as a DEI practitioner, while also being a full human in the world who holds both marginalized and privileged identities and is learning to navigate, hopefully all of it, most of it, (laughs) from a perspective of kind of holding myself as a whole human in the same way I try to hold others or aspire to hold others, is I think the thing that continues to surprise me as much as I'm committed to our collective liberation and my own liberation, how often still dominant culture ways of understanding the world still shape and frame how I navigate the world. And I think the reason it feels surprising, quote unquote, to me is because I've been in this work for approximately 22 years at this point, and yet there's still layers to excavate and further unpack and further understand for myself. And so while it's still a surprise, like, oh my gosh, I'm still committed to patriarchy in these ways, I'm also still committed to unlearning those ways of being and embracing, I don't know, more, again, holistically informed ways of knowing and being and operating in this world. It's an ongoing journey, but there are these things that still pop up where I'm like, oh, wow, I'm still committed to that, or I have been committed to that. I feel so fortunate to be in this work that actually gives me the privilege truly to excavate those spaces within myself. You know, it's so interesting. I even told, I don't think I ever told anybody this, but I'm about to tell you and obviously everybody who's listening. But one of the things that I did this last year is I wrote on a sticky note and put it onto my desk. Like I am a human being. And I had that on my desk. I mean, I just cleared my desk and tried to get it all set up because, you know, we're at the new year and I, I didn't need to carry all my mini piles into the into this year. But I came across that, right? I, I had forgotten that it was there. And I was like, why did I write this? But it was really a lot to, of what you were just saying, right? This, I am human. And I think it was the reminder that in this work, we do, it's personal, right? There's parts of it that are not, but a lot of it is personal. And a lot of it is like, being able to take a beat and give yourself the opportunity to do some of the same hard things that we might be asking people in our teams or people in our organizations to do, that we do that work also, right? Like, and a lot of times we're doing that work alongside people. And so I think that you are human, right? Like I hold myself to this standard sometimes, just being a practitioner where I'm like, you should know that. You you should have that down pat. This should be, right? And it's like, 
no, I'm human also. And that is actually, I think, what makes us good at our jobs because we remember and we know it's not like that thing that happens over there to only those. It's like, no, this is happening to us too. And we're here with you and we understand the challenges. So thanks for sharing that. You gave me an opportunity to share something that I, I learned about myself too. We are human. <laughs> So maybe you could just share a little bit, if you don't mind, about your journey. Because I always love to hear, everybody has so many different ways of coming into this work. So I'm, I'm curious, like, how did you get into a career where you were pursuing diversity, equity, and inclusion, but not just DEI, but really specifically within the healthcare sector? I identify as woman, heterosexual, also multiracial, multi-ethnic. My dad is Black and Indigenous, and my mom is white. And I grew up in a very affluent white community in the Pacific Northwest. And there was a lot of exclusion in that community, very ex explicit, but also kind of in a subtle-ish way. The way I talk about it was there was a lot of racialized bullying that became very normalized in my growing up years. And I say normalized, not in a way to excuse it. It was, you know, abhorrent and not okay at all. And my dad is a tough love kind of guy, even the, to this day. And he, his perspective was, yep, you're experiencing racism. This is what it's like for you to be at the time a kid of color. And then now as you know, a woman of color, he, he would still say, yep, you're going to experience racism. This is what it is. In that journey, there was like some building around kind of personal resilience, but where I found my distrust and the most harm I experienced was for again, as a child, a kid of color, and feeling like, okay, I can be experiencing this with my peers, but when adults, including my parents and other parents involved, don't make the space safe, those were like the most activating things for me and feeling like, wow, as someone holding marginalized identities, I'm really not safe here. Mm. Fast forward, I ended up getting my master's in developmental psychology because I thought I would be doing Similar work, same DEI work, but in educational spaces where I wanted children to just have a really liberated educational experience, not hampered by, you know, again, experiencing bullying or marginalization based off of their identity or really bullying of any kind, right? But that was my passion. As I got into the work where I found myself really resonating is in working with the folks, the adults who make up institutions. So whether that's educationally or in the, you know, administration of justice system, so forth and so on, there was just a lot. I just found really rich, fertile ground to try to invest my time and energy. With all of that, when it came to looking at health disparities, I just really recognized a connection between the ways in which folks are vulnerable and entering into a healthcare space, even if you're going for your annual exams and you're not necessarily in the moment presenting with anything critical, how your doctors here perceive the nurse practitioners and what have you, how they make that space welcoming and safe for you to be who you fully are, share your full medical history, talk yep. about and name, you know, part of my stress may be I'm experiencing discrimination in the workplace. And that's a heavy load. I'm also watching my kiddo, them trying to be their full selves within an educational setting. And me as a parent is trying to navigate all of that. And I just felt a real call to help, again, the folks who make up these institutions see the connections and the linkages between having a heart for the work. And by that, I mean being moved by understanding how history has marginalized communities, how disparities are rooted in some troubled past in our country and internationally even. And then how, from a logical stance, can we work our way out of it? We've created the systems as humans and as a larger society. We've created these institutions. We've created these ways of upholding ways of oppressing folks. And at the same time, I truly believe if we can do a good job of connecting the heart work and the head work, we can work our way out of them. So I've done DEI work in a lot of sectors, the patterns of ways in which cultural shifts can happen. And again, that opportunity for those things has been sure. the patterns again are, are consistent. There are some unique things within healthcare for sure. 
some of it is like the data is so rich. There's, it's like no denying these things are happening. And that's what has brought me to this work in a way that I feel really grounded in. Oh, yeah. You know, and I think this idea that there's adults that are making up these institutions, right? That's the way that you said it. Like there's adults Mm -hmm. making up these institutions. When you think about it, there's adults making up all kinds of institutions, right? How do we all collectively either perpetuate or how do we disrupt some of these things that, you know, that we're seeing. And so being able to take that moment and really provide that, that service and in the healthcare space. Oh my gosh. Like I see it all of the time. For those of you who, who don't know, we, Ron and I, it took us a long time to get this podcast started because we had a whole conversation about disparities in, in health, because one of the things that, you know, we run through uplifting impact is one of four enterprises um, in the flying elephant portfolio. And one of the other ones is birth coach Milwaukee. And we started Birth Coach Milwaukee because of the disparities in birthing outcomes. And really, a lot of it had to do with what, exactly what you just said, right? What does it feel like for me to come in and just for an appointment, even it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be anything that's like an elaborate moment, right? And have a conversation where I feel like I can't be truly authentic. But what does that mean? How does that change how what I'm prescribed, how somebody might see what what's manifesting or what I'm describing or how somebody might relate to me in a moment where I am in a, a situation of distress. Like there's just so many things. And the thing that always gets me, oh, now I'm on a little bit of a soapbox, but I, I had this whole conversation with somebody who's like, well, I don't know, you know, if nurse practitioners need to have training in inclusion work. I was like, are you kidding me? All healthcare professionals do, because just think about how much of our experiences are based. Yes, some of it is we draw blood. Some of it is that we get, you know, reports back. But a lot of the data that people are collecting on how they're going to help us move forward and be the healthiest version of ourselves has to do with my comfort level and how much I am going to tell you. Yeah, so if Absolutely. with you, I'm not going to tell you my Maybe the things that how bad it hurts or how often it hurts or, you know, what the hurt level actually is. So, yes, absolutely. People have to feel included. And you got to do that pretty quickly because we don't have a lot of time sometimes with our practitioners. And so it was one of those things where I'm like, no, that's the, one of the most, most important places where we have to build that kind of trust um, because too much of it, too much um, of what we are, are doing is defined by my comfort level in telling you the truth. I fully endorse everything you're saying. And I would argue from the greeters at the door to, I mean, I've had conversations with security folks who are struggling with, wow, if I'm seeing someone presenting with drug addiction issues who likely truly need healthcare, but I'm also navigating my bias towards this person's on drugs, they're unsafe, should I even let them in the building? So I would argue again from Everything. nutrition services to the most applied, you know, nurse practitioner who has, again, to your point, drawing blood from a patient, all of those folks need to have training and understanding and be given the tools to be able to understand and navigate and hopefully mitigate their biases and the best ways for us to present again, an equitable and inclusive. Right. Especially if we want better outcomes, right? Like if we want outcomes that match and we want services that are matching, right. Then we have to make sure we're paying attention to this. Okay. So my question, perhaps we asked, we answered this already, but is why is it important? You know, like when you think about this role of like cultural competency, everyone from the greeter at the door to the person, like you said, who's drawing the blood or the person who's performing the surgery, why is it important for us to have cultural competency built into the care that people receive in the healthcare space? So we did answer this a little bit, but I think there's so much still to add to the conversation because it's extremely complex. So from the stance of, you know, everyone within an organization needs to, again, even the folks who are in that administrative role, like myself, I do not engage with patients. That's not my role. And at the same time, I am making policies. I am supporting the organization and developing strategies to, again, move forward on our commitment to DEI. And when it comes down to at the end of the day, I would say kind of twofold, like, why is this important? There is the element, yes, of patient care and patients being able to enter into a space 
where they present why they're having pain. Maybe this is a chronic issue. So many elements of what's going on and what you and I were talking about earlier in our conversation around seeing folks as full human beings and that they're not just coming in as some siloed Mm -hmm. entity that is not engaging in family and community and the like. At the same time, I would say on the internal side of how are we supporting our employees, again, from the greeter, the nutrition services person to those nurses and nurse practitioners, those folks, the healthcare folks are also entering into these spaces as full human beings. So if you're a nurse practitioner and you are distracted yourself by why well, I'm listening to this patient and I don't necessarily feel like I have the cultural knowledge or understanding or even humility enough to ask the questions of what's informing, what took you so long to maybe come in? Or maybe you don't believe in taking, I don't know, Advil or Tylenol because of your personal beliefs around that. But if I don't understand that, so I'm so distracted by, I don't necessarily feel like I have the tools to support this patient. I've seen this with, not at my current organization, but other organizations that if someone is identifying, let's say as LGBTQIA+, and I recognize I actually have this bridge to this patient to be able to talk about, I understand where you're coming from, but I don't feel like I, as the employee, am in a safe space where my disclosure of my own identity may be of comfort to the patient and the folks and my colleagues who I'm working with. So a large part of my work is, and this is where I see organizations wanting to go so immediately to the, how are we serving community? How are we doing these external things people can see? But again, I'll use the word bridge, but the bridge to that often can be in the empowering and the equipping of employees and making that inclusive and equitable workspace so that they themselves can show up with all of their skills and all of their insights and all of their commitment to meet patients and their colleagues where they're at. And I think that that's a really important element from that kind of holistic perspective that we don't always... Yeah, especially like thinking about it. And I think it's not just in healthcare, it's in all the spaces that we work in. But are we doing internally what we're trying to do externally. I, I know I had this one just amazing client mm-hmm. right in because of her religious background. And this is a client in the birth coaching space, but her religious background, there was a number of things that were really important to her about her birthing experience. And I remember after, you know, I was her doula, it was an amazing experience and all the things. And afterwards, the nurse who was her attending nurse through the whole delivery came up to me and pulled me to the side and said, you know, there are so many things that I saw you do, I've never seen done before. And I've had other patients, right, who come from this faith background. And I didn't even know, like, to your point, I didn't know to ask, I didn't realize what a big deal that was. And so I'm thinking about how their experiences were so much different than the patient we just had. And I can see now how some of the discomfort wasn't because they were delivering a baby. Some of it was because of things that I was unintentionally doing. And I thought that that admission, that reflection, all of that was really amazing. But I I was also struck in that moment, you know, and I asked the question, I was like, well, what can we do to change that? Because you are going to have more people who come from this faith background. And I know you feel better because now you know what you're going to do, but what happens to the other people on the other shifts that are are doing this work too? So that internal, right? I think when you are a service provider, especially in the healthcare, like you come into this work because I assume I mean, I know I do it because I want to support people. I want to help them have healthy outcomes. But if I don't even have those tools in my toolkit, then how can I use them? Right? I don't even know that I'm doing what I'm doing because I I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's so real. And I think so often what I've seen in the evolution of diversity and inclusion work over the last few years, because I, again, with 2020 and, and even previous years, this uptick in organizational commitment to doing this work is, again, so often wanting to hurry up and getting to those patient outcomes and just like, hey, we said this is a commitment employees, get it together or figure it out. And what we miss is the opportunity to equip at that scalable level. You're speaking to, you had this one interaction with a nurse who was like, oh, aha moment. How do we scale that? How do we 
replicate that so others within the organization can also be similarly equipped. So that's an amazing question. I'm going to send it right back to you. What is it that we do? Robin, tell us. Do we make sure that other people are <laughs> equipped? How do we how do we systematize this across our institutions? I'm a firm believer in again giving folks training, giving folks language, even as someone who has lived and continues to live, and again, that balance of a marginalized and, and privileged experience. The times when I have been given language and insight and understanding, like, yes, I have personal responsibility but there's also been societal structures that I framed and shaped the way that I think and navigate and others do as well. I have felt so buoyed is the word able to like, Oh, okay. This isn't like, this is a little bit of a turbulent water. And at the same time, I feel like I have what I need to continue to persevere. My language, my liberation of self and others will continue to evolve. But I have been steadily equipped, again, whether I seek that equipping for myself or I've been fortunate to be a part of organizations that have provided it for me. I would say that even though that feels very personal and anecdotal, what I've seen in my work is when that same support of equipping, giving language, here's what I have found. The real crux of the issue is not just as an example. Here's like a list of the types of biases you can likely see in the workplace or in healthcare. But when you give folks the opportunity to position themselves as learners and actually practice in a safe space, I have seen that those learnings exponentially evolve, right? So it's one thing to say, hey, here's some language and then, you know, unleash your folks on the populace or in this case, like your patients. It's another thing to say, hey, here's some language and here's some other folks like they're not actually presenting with a medical need right now. They may be a colleague who's similar to you, but you get to practice asking someone, hey, what's your sexual orientation and gender identity? And having the practice response of, oh, thank goodness. I, you know, no one asked me that. I'm actually transgender and I'm transitioning. So I'm on these hormones. Oh my goodness, that's going to impact a drug interaction we were thinking for you. Let's rethink that to the, and this is what I've seen a little bit more in some of the spaces I've been in. Hey, what's your sexual orientation and gender identity? How dare you ask me that question? Can't you clearly see I'm a cishet woman and being able to calmly, you know what? Thank you for sharing that with me. These are just standard questions. We ask all of our patients to better deliver the best care we can. Oh, well, now that you're sharing about that, I'm actually in perimenopause. Oh, okay. That may also inform, you know, what process we're going to put you through. But if the person can, if that patient can be held and seen, it's such to your point, there can be so much more shared and divulged, which really informs that care. But if practitioners don't have those safe spaces to try that on and learn in a lower consequential space, meaning it's not going to impact a patient immediately because they're trying on a scenario, they're giving the practice space. And so often I think we lean too heavily as a Western society as I told you, you need to be aware of your biases. Go forth. Go That's forth. all you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> go, go forth and apply, <laughs> you know, as opposed to, oh, wow. Like when I'm in a room of predominantly what I would assume are cishet men, I, as a woman of color, feel some yeah. hesitancy. What's that about? Let me understand that. Let me unpack that. I know that there's a truth that for the most part, I have really great cishet men in my life who aren't weird, but there's something there for me to better understand and better unpack. And so I think if more people can be given that permission to do their personal excavating, but also apply the tools they're being given, it's, I mean, so much more it, can be arrived. You think at. about it. I always tell people like in this space, We do so many things that are so different than what we do in other places, right? So if I read a book on how to do some financial prospecting or something like that, right? Like something that's maybe outside of the normal course of what I do in my everyday practice. So I read like article on it, or I spent 15 minutes listening to somebody talk about it. You wouldn't be like, hey, you know what I want you to do for our entire hospital unit? Go ahead and do the financial forecasting for us. Like you're good. Go ahead. Right. You would, we wouldn't do that. 
you know, you wouldn't be like, oh, right. okay. Um, so I want you to read this or spend 15 minutes with this. Um, somebody just talking to you about, you know, marketing in 2024. And now what we're going to do is we're going to give you all of our marketing assets and we want you to go ahead and devise the whole program for the, or we want you to be the person who speaks in front of, or we want you to hold the next marketing meeting, or we want, you wouldn't do that. But yeah, in this space, we do it all yeah. the time. We're going to give you this little bit of knowledge in this little bitty way in one time. And then we expect for you to just become the most inclusive leader in the world. And it's like, no, because this is yeah. an evolutionary thing. We have to, like any skill, any muscle we're trying to build, we got to practice it. We got to have those places. So, yeah. oh, Robin, I don't want to end this podcast with you. <laughs> One of the things that we really appreciate, and I think one of the things our listeners really appreciate, is just being able to maybe take away from you. So I'm just going to ask you one more thing, but like a piece of wisdom or some knowledge that you've gained when you think about what you want other people to know. I I, I love being able to. I'm doing this selfishly too because I I love being able to hear from people. Like, what are some what are some things that are just like go tos for you? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I have really held on to, you heard me mention earlier that navigating the heart and the headspace, right? Like the deep compassion, yes. but also we need strategy. I would layer on top of that because oftentimes I think folks, myself included, feel like diversity and inclusion work is this heavy slog upward, like to try to redirect disparities and mitigate them and so forth and so on. But one of the things I have found to be as much as it is work to do, I am so inspired by the bright spots that are involved. And a huge part of this is the community building. And sometimes I think people feel like the, the community building is just coming together and grasping hands and singing Kumbaya. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a space for that, too. And also what I have found is that community building and connecting with folks and just like finding joy and creating spaces for us to be our more full selves offer these, again, I call them bright spots where we're excited. It's generative. It's inspiring. We want to come back together again. I was on an employee resource group meeting late last year, and it was all women of color. And we were just all looking around and like, wow, this is really unique. And this is just a moment. And there wasn't a lot of like huge ideas or a big strategic planning session, but it was community building and it was resilience building. And it was, I can't wait to see you in the hallway again yeah. and just have a smile moment. And so I love that. I think that oftentimes, again, there's work to be done, but in doing that work, there's so much opportunity for richness and connection with Absolutely. one another as humans. And I have found that to and be. That's actually inspired. one of our you know, core, core values is this idea of joy, because just like you, I feel like there's so many bright spots in the work that we do. When you have those moments, like that one I explained with the nurse, right? We have this moment and you're like, okay, forever, forever and ever now, every person that this nurse interacts with is going to have a different kind of experience. What a moment that she shared that with me, that she and I had built up enough rapport and enough community, right? And then when I see her in the hospital, she's like, hey, right? Like we have a whole, we have a whole thing now together. I mean, birthing a child, you can get real close to the people who are around you and still, right? <laughs> Just having that space and, and, and knowing that, that that's what connected us, that the learning could bring us together. It doesn't, we have to be ashamed of the fact that we don't know. I don't know everything. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm still trying to learn. Yeah. So speaking of community, how can our community stay in touch with you? What's the best way for them to, to stay connected and see what, all the cool things you're doing? I think one of the best ways to stay, I've been, really been working on this over the last year, is LinkedIn. Honestly, you can find me, Robin Johnson. I do do a little bit of, hey, you know, people connect with me and I think you can follow me pretty easily. But I put, it was on another podcast earlier last year. I posted it there can see the work that I'm up to. And I love just connecting with people. I, this idea of multiple perspectives has really, again, been probably another key point, I would say, as far as skill building. But I love connecting with people across all sorts of industries, sectors, different roles that they have. So again, LinkedIn is probably the easiest way to find me, Robin Johnson. 
CDE, MS. So yes, please connect with me. I love being reached out to. And even if we grab a virtual. Fantastic. Well, I will make sure that the link is in our show notes. But Robin, just really want to say thank you for taking some time out of all of your work to be here with us and creating community with me. I'm so glad that you're part of my network now. And we're so thankful to everybody who was able to tune in to this week's episode of Uplifting Impact into our podcast because we need everybody, every single person. So everyone who's listening, we need everybody. If we're going to really uplift the impact, we need everybody to be involved. In order to do that, right, we always ask that you just take a second, literally this takes just a couple seconds to share the episode, whether that is reposting it or sending somebody a link. We also love to hear from you. So feel free to comment on our website, upliftingimpact.com or to chat with us directly too. You know, we're always on LinkedIn. So you can contact me, you can contact us through the Uplifting Impact page. You could contact Justin, our co-host, Justin Ponder through his page. But really, we also enjoy hearing from you. And it's what makes the podcast, I think, better because we often get ideas or recommendations from you and, and we move on those things. So please feel free to connect with us. And until next week, keep on uplifting that impact. Thanks, friends.